uh, chair of the Department of Ophthalmology and try to keep this happy gang moving in the right direction and moving in tune. Uh, and it's an absolute honor to be able to present one of our outstanding faculty to talk about a fascinating and important subject. Uh, Dr. Payne and I go way back. I'm trying to think exactly how long we go back, but it's a good long ways. I don't want to say it's too long because that would imply that she's uh, older than she's still very young. We know that. Uh, but uh, she started at Yale, came to our medical school here as a superstar, and I was lucky enough to be her advisor, and she and I worked on some really interesting studies that are really some of the seminal work that was done in that field. And then uh, uh, clearly she wanted to be an ophthalmologist. She took some extra time in research, uh, and I was sad she didn't match with us. Uh, we try I tried hard to convince her. But she went to UCSF. I was a superstar there, and then went back to Children's Hospital in Boston to do her training in pediatric ophthalmology. Uh, has been with us. Uh, this is a lady who knows and understands this field incredibly well. She's one of our extremely bright young faculty members. And on top of everything else, uh, and I, I remember this part, I missed it a little bit, but uh, she's a harpist and uh, was uh, good enough in regards to harp. She had a chance to perform in many different venues in many areas. Uh, she's a proud mother. Uh, and uh, we're proud to have her, and with that, we'll let you tell everything that you ever wanted to know about Blasia. <laughs> it's all yours. Buddy. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. So, um, this is my daughter that's over here crying, but um, uh, I am a Utah girl. Like uh, Dr. Olson said, I actually grew up across the street in Federal Heights, and I'm so happy to be back here. Um, I uh, was uh, lucky enough when I was in um, I, college to, um, when I was in college, I uh, didn't know what I was going to do with my life and was trying to figure that out. I had d done a lot of music and uh, was actually a history major and trying to figure out uh, how I wanted to um, use my life and what I wanted to do. And my older sister had a little girl who was born with a congenital cataract halfway through I was in college. And she had to have surgery when she was three days of old. and. Um, that after that she had to, she was treated with a contact lens and treated with many many hours of patching and that experience was uh, really profound upon me I uh, just thought this was an amazing visual system that we have uh, that is so sensitive to stimulus that we have to uh, do surgery within the first couple of weeks of life or this child will never develop vision. And um, my sister, uh, you know, thinks Dr. Hoffman is a hero because that is who uh, did the surgery at the, end, at the time. And um, I kind of started getting interested in medicine that way and decided to go to medical school. And this is a picture of that niece. Um, as you can see, she's got a little bit of eye crossing. Whoops, she got a little bit of eye crossing because of that cataract. Her, eye, her right eye was the one with the cataract. Um, and then for many years, she was treated with patching and glasses to um, strengthen the vision in this eye. Um, and uh, so for many years, this was an ongoing battle for her and her mother to argue about that. Um, but she has actually had a very good outcome, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, so I was lucky enough to um, be able to come back here to medical school, and like uh, Dr. Olson said, I did some research with him, but I also really got into um, doing some genetic research, and I worked with Dr. Zhang and, um, uh, when I was in medical school, because I thought I wanted to do ophthalmology. And he was helpful in, in helping me match in ophthalmology in uh, San Francisco, where I really decided that I did want to do pediatrics, because it was a great mix of cataracts and a lot of other pathology, including amblyopia. And uh, so I went on to do fellowship in Boston, where I learned about the hardest part of um, my job, which is uh, uh, adult strabismus, because they have double vision and it's very tough to treat. Um, and then I've been back here five years now, and uh, working here, I was very lucky to be recruited back, and I'm very happy to be here um, and have many great colleagues here. But these past five years, I've really thought a lot more about this developing visual system as I see so many kids with amblyopia in my clinic every day. Um, and then also, um, I, I've had a, I, my daughter has some strabismus as well, so it's caused me to really think about it even harder, how to treat it, how to make, how to make these treatments better for families, and uh, I'm, that's what I'm going to talk about today. 
The developing visual system is very complicated. The, your eyes are at the front of your brain. That message is carried all the way back to the back of your brain and it's interpreted back there. So, so much of your brain has optic radiations running through it that you can imagine that many neurologic diseases affect our eye, our visual perception and our tracking. Um, some of the uh, neurophysiologists who did early work in this were Hubel and Wiesel and they won the 1981 Nobel Prize for this. Um, they took kittens and they they um, sewed one eye shut in the kittens. They took some of the kittens and showed both eyes shut and then they you know, left some of the kittens. And then they looked at that back part of the brain and compared it between those three different groups. And what they found was that in these kittens who had one eye sutured shut for the six months of, first six months of life, all of the neurons in the back of their brain were driven by that one eye and nothing you know, was driven by the eye that had been closed. And when they opened both eyes up for the next 14 months and left them that way, they were all still stayed that way. Um, these were different than the kittens who had both eyes shut. They had a third of their neurons were driven by both eyes, a third were driven by one eye, and a third were just unresponsive and didn't develop. Um, and this was in contrast to those normal kittens who had both eyes open. So we know that there is what we call this critical period of time, and it's the time in which you have to have stimulation to your brain to learn how to use your vision. And if you don't do that in this first few months of life, and for the kitten, you know, it's sometime in these first six months of life, you will never develop vision in that eye. It's permanent brain damage that we cannot reverse. And that is what amblyopia is. It's a similar thing in, in, uh, in adults, in humans. So um, it's a reduction of best corrected visual acuity, meaning that these are people who don't see 20-20 out of one eye, but everything else in their eye is normal. There's no other reason why they don't see well, except for the fact that there was no visual stimuli that was given to that eye in the, fir in the you know, sentinel first months of life, or first few years of life in, in uh, uh, humans. It affects 1 to 3 percent of the population. It develops in childhood, but if it's untreated, you know, the effects last a lifetime. And this is something that is preventable. There are three different things that commonly cause uh, strabi or, uh, amblyopia in, in uh, my patients. Uh, the first is strabismus, or any eye misalignment. In children, this is commonly eye crossing, but in an, you know, it can be eyes that drift out. It can be one eye that's a little bit higher than the other. Um, uh, and the other thing that does is refractive differences. So these are differences in the prescription between the two eyes. This can be nearsightedness, farsightedness, or astigmatism. Or the last, which is the most least common, but the most difficult to treat is visual deprivation. So these are things that block the image from getting to the back of the eye to be interpreted. And this is you know, caused by things like cataract or corneal disease. Strabismus, this is a huge part of what I do. It is misalignment of the eyes. Um, as you can see in this schematic here, this is somebody with crossed eyes and their eyes are looking at two different images. So as an adaptation mechanism, the brain will adapt and choose one eye, you know, the children will choose one eye to look at, out of, and one eye to ignore. And then that eye, they will, you know, because otherwise they would get double vision. So they will adapt and just learn to look out of the one eye and completely turn off the other eye. And that eye becomes amblyopic. Foveal disparity, that just means that this back part of the eye, so this, this eye is lined up to see this moon and this eye is lined up to see the sun, uh, this star here. But the children will just choose one eye and, sometime, and we don't, sometimes we don't understand why they choose one or the other, but they will choose this one. They will develop good vision in this eye and they will not develop good vision in this eye. The other, uh, one of the other common reasons why children develop amblyopia is called anisometropia, which is a long word to mean these two eyes are different shapes. So um, this is a little schematic here um, showing that these eyes are straight. They you know, are lined up. They're both looking at this bunny. But this eye is focused here. So this eye would be clear. The image would be clear. Whereas this eye would not, because this eye is a little bit shorter. This eye is a little more what we call hyperopic. Most kids are a little hyperopic. And if their both eyes are hyperopic, it's not a problem, because their lens here can change shape. It be can become a little bit fatter, a little bit stronger, and it can move that image into focus. So it can take that image that was into focus here and move it up. If that's the case in both eyes, 
they will focus them both. If that's the case in one eye where this eye has to work a little harder, they just won't do it and they all are this way. They will just use this eye to see and this eye they leave blur and they just never learn to see clearly in this eye. Um, you know, most people at, in adulthood are emetropic, meaning they don't need glasses to see clearly. Some people are myopic, meaning their eye is a little bit too long, the image is in focus in front of the, in front of the eye in front of the back of the eye where it should be. Children are all hyperopic, meaning their eye is too small. And this is, you know, evolutionarily, they have evolved that way because their eye is going to grow. So most children will be hyperopic and then grow into being emetropic. Um, but the problem comes when one eye is more hyperopic than the other because the hyperopic eye, the shorter eye, becomes the amblyopic eye. So, um, and this is a, an accommodative hyperopic eye, meaning this child has moved their lens to move that image into focus. And most kids can do that, but they just don't if there's a comp competition between the two eyes. So we treat them by putting a pair of glasses. So we just make, put a lens here that's a little stronger to move that focus up to this back of this eye here. Um, uh, amblyopia is associated with strabismus, associated with eye misalignment in 50% of cases, and is more common in premature infants, which we're seeing more and more premature infants as, we're get, as our resuscitation me methods are getting better. Um, uh, it's also more common in families who have a history of amblyopia. Uh, sometimes it can be strabismic or uh, anisometropic or some kind of combination of the two. But amblyopia is more than a difference in visual acuity. When you go into the doctor's office and read the chart, you're just reading a black and white chart on a screen in a dark room. But that is so much less than your whole vision is. It's so much less than you, you know, perceiving vision out of doors. It's, you know, vision also consists of color, movement, contour, contrast, and, and binocular vision in, in people who have two eyes working together. And these things are all abnormal in people with amblyopia. One quick and dirty way we have to measure, um, to pick up on if kids have amblyopia, is if we can get them to cooperate with stereo acuity testing. This is a little bit like a 3D movie. So you have to have good acuity in both eyes and straight eyes to be able to perceive a 3D movie because um, you have to have your eyes working together. So um, we have these children see if they can put these glasses on. So these glasses, you know, when they're looking at these circles, one of these circles will pop up. And the one that pops up is actually a little bit different out of one eye versus the other eye. It's a little bit to the left in, in, on the top one and a little bit to the right here. But your brain integrates that together and you get, the, you get the sensation that the image is coming up. People with crossed eyes or people with severe amblyopia who don't have two eyes working together do not have stereopsis. And uh, parents are always worried when you, they come in and they don't have stereopsis and, and wondering, does that mean they don't have depth perception? And the answer to that is no. Uh, they do have depth perception because you don't have to have stereopsis to have depth perception. There's many other things that play into um, uh, depth perception, such as object overlap, object size, highlights and shadows, perspective. And realistically, your stereopsis is only uh, it's only active for the first few feet of your vision, and then after that, you're really relying on monocular cues. Um, however, it probably does have some, uh, some professional implications. And certainly, you will not become a fighter pilot if you don't have good stereopsis. They do check that. When I interviewed for residency, at least one residency uh, had me tested my stereo acuity, so some surgery programs do that. Um, and you probably won't be a Wimbledon champion. I, I think there's um, some amount of having really good stereo acuity to be able to tell that spin on that ball. But um, uh, we also have, are recently finding that there are other things that are abnormal in people with amblyopia, things as simple as reading. So this was a study that was done that compared amblyopic children to normal children with treated eye crossing. And they had them read a passage and then they tested these children and had them answer a series of questions. And only the kids who got 80% of the questions right were included. But they had a monitor and they monitored their eye movement. And what they found was the kids with amblyopia, and this is kids using both eyes, so they, you know, it's not like they're just using their amblyopic eye, but they have much more forward saccades. So they do not, you know, smoothly follow words across a page. What they do is kind of overshoot lots and have lots more saccades. So you can imagine that 
reading is much more difficult for these, kind, for these kids. And what they found also was that the depth of amblyopia, meaning the kids who had worse visual acuity in that amblyopic eye, were not necessarily the ones who had uh, worse reading speeds or slower reading speeds. Treatment for amblyopia is most effective in the young children, like we said, because that developing visual system is most sensitive in the early days. Um, but it's very difficult to assess vision in these young children. Um, how do we assess vision? Um, when kids are born, we, we, we want to make sure they react to light. By six weeks of age, we want to make sure they have maintained eye contact. Three months of age, we want to make sure that they can fix and follow an object around. But you can imagine that kids with amblyopia still are going to be able to fix and follow with both eyes. So it's not always a great way of, of testing vision. And by two, two years old, you know, we can start to test their vision using these pictures across a room. And later, you know, we use the standard eye chart. In young children, we try to look at their fixation preference. What does that mean? In kids who are crossed, you know, they're looking at you with one eye and one eye's crossed. And usually that one eye that's crossed is always crossed. And then we will cover the eye they're looking out of and force them to look out of the eye, their non-preferred eye. And then watching how quickly they go back to their preferred eye is really, you know, can tell us something about their vision. If they come right back, we know, we know they have pretty severe amblyopia. If they kind of wait for a minute and then kind of go back, usually they, they don't. Uh, have a severe of amblyopia and some kids, especially the kids that are really, really crossed, sometimes won't have amblyopia because they use this eye to use, look that way and this one to look this way and then they just don't move their eyes around. So um, we can look at their fixation preference and in kids who aren't crossed, we can kind of simulate crossing by putting a prism in front of their eyes. So this young child, you know, we have a prism that was put here in front of this eye and if both eyes are strong, that eye will move this way to follow that where the image is displaced and then move back. Um, and that's another way we can simulate strabismus or simulate my eye misalignment to see if they bring their eyes back into being straight. This is tough in the clinic, though, because the second you get that prism up there, they start looking at the prism and stop looking at you, and it, it, it can be, it can be quite, quite tricky. But, it, you know, it's, it's quite important when we're looking at, at kids and trying to figure out um, before we dilate them and things what, what their fixation preference is. Do they have a stronger eye? One other way we can test vision is by having children look at these, at these uh, cards. And in, uh, infants have a tendency to look at the pattern. So these cards have a pattern on one side, and the patterns get progressively, the stripes get progressively thinner. And the kids with better acuity will uh, be able to follow these cards down further and further. The problem is that we're often trying to tell the difference between one eye and the other, and so you have to put a patch on. And you will lose the cooperation often of the kid uh, when you put that patch on, or if you, not when you put the patch on the first eye, when you take it off and put it on the second eye. So it, it can be quite tough, but it, it can tell you a lot. And, you know, it can be very useful, too, in kids who are young and have a brain tumor and is not responding, you know, it's, it's responding somewhat to chemotherapy, but we're not really sure. It, it hasn't really shown growth on MRI or things, and sometimes we'll be trying to follow vision with things like this. So th this kind can be uh, useful in, in situations like that. Um, this is the visual acuity chart that most of us are familiar with if we've ever had an eye exam. Um, you know, kids usually have to be five or, or older. It just really depends on the kid to be able to um, cooperate. We need to test each eye, and kids with amblyopia are quite tricky. And peeking around a patch or peeking around a, uh, peeking around a paddle, which is why we often have to patch them. Something else interesting about amblyopia is what we call this crowding phenomenon. This is a brain disease. This is brain damage. So if you ask an amblyopic kid to read this line with their amblyopic eye, they're going to tell you E, P, F, and then add a few more letters in there. They will, some, they will be much better at telling you what the letters on the first and the last are because their brain cannot organize that information. And oftentimes, they can see the letters but they can't tell you what they are. They'll read a lot more in between them. The second you let them read with their good eye, they'll say, oh yeah, and they'll read them all for you. But they, it's what we call this crowding phenomenon. So they will often read the chart great if you give them one letter, if you give them one letter and make it smaller, smaller, smaller. But the second you add these bars around it or crowd the, crowd the letter, 
they get confused and can't tell you. So uh, to be able to detect amblyopia, we will often, even in kids who can't read a whole line, just put one letter and put what they're, they're, we call these crowding bars around them. Um, the AAP, which is the Academy of Pediatrics, the Academy of Ophthalmology, and the Academy of Pediatric Ophthalmology, these are what they recommend for screening for all kids. When they're born, the pediatrician should check their red reflex. When they're six months, the pediatrician should again check their red reflex. And then between six months and three years, they don't need to do anything until they can read the chart. But this is a long period of time if some child has amblyopia that we are not picking up on and, and treating. Red reflex testing. Some pediatricians are really great at this, and um, some are not so much. Most are not so much. In fact, my niece who was diagnosed with a cataract, it was actually her father who picked up on that cataract and was staring at her and noticed that. It was not the pediatrician. And that's often the case. Moms are often better at, at this than, than, than pediatricians. So it's kind of a skill that is being lost. I love to have pediatric residents in the clinic, and this is the biggest skill I try to teach them. It's just in every kid. Do you see that, this is di that there's a difference in the, the reflex between these two eyes? Um, because I think it's a tough skill to pick up on, and most kids are normal. So it's hard sometimes for pediatricians to or pediatrics residents to learn that skill. So you can see here that this seems pretty dramatic, that this, this reflex is much brighter than this one. This uh, child is uh, much more nearsighted and has more astigmatism in this eye, so this eye is duller than this one. Um, this kid is very nearsighted in both, but this eye is more nearsighted than this one. So you can see just by looking at a red reflex, you can tell um, uh, that these, there are differences here, that these red reflexes are not equal. But it's much easier to tell something that is dramatic, like retinoblastoma, which is an eye cancer. You can see the retina here is popping up and pushing against the back of that lens there. But this is a skill that is kind of being lost. And some of it now is being taken over by these photo screeners. So these are, uh, some insurances are reimbursing pediatricians for these, so more and more are getting these. It's a device that analyzes the red reflex, but it it's, can be useful in these kids who are young, but it's not accurate unless the child's fixating. And in my experience now, there are a few pediatrics offices that are now referring to me who have these. It's not a very accurate test. And part of that, I think, is the parameters in which they're measuring what they're referring for. Some of it is that that doesn't work as well on, on young kids. But it's, it's similar to this in that it's just a machine to try to an analyze this red reflex. Should every child have an eye exam? Should we be seeing every kid to see if we can pick up on amblyopia? No, that's just too many kids, especially in this valley. We really don't even have enough pediatric ophthalmologists to deal with the number of kids we have in this valley. You know, the Moran is working hard to try to hire more. We've recently hired Leah, who is back there, who is an MD, PhD, who's much smarter than I am and doing lots of research, and we're hiring somebody else. But there just are too many children to really uh, see everybody. Um, and the reality is most kids don't need glasses. Most kids are fine and have normal visual acuity in each eye. The other thing is that giving classes to kids um, who don't need them is, is potentially harmful, not just because the lenses are often flip-flopped, which I see in my clinic all the time, um, but uh, because it, in some of these kids, we know they're hyperopic. We know that they're far-sighted, and that's how evolutionarily they've been built. So maybe if we put the glasses on these kids, we're um, interrupting how their eye grows, and we're, we're stopping that. Um, it's also just an impractical, especially as more and more both parents are working, it's going to be, it would be an overload on health systems. So we really don't want to see every kid. Um, the other thing is that all kids, everybody has refractive error. Everybody has a, you know, glasses can make their vision better, but that doesn't mean we should put them all in glasses. And for young kids, we tolerate a lot of refractive errors. So you can see here in a kid that's less than one, if they have uh, minus five prescription or more, we put them in glasses. But that's a pretty high prescription. So, you know, those kids with uh, just small amounts of myopia, we don't need to treat because their vision is going to develop normally. Um, this is, you know, a, a table just saying that we, we don't need to put glasses on every kid, even if they have, you know, some prescription. We want to look at the things that are going to lead to amblyopia and treat those kids. This was a study done at Vanderbilt by a pediatric ophthalmologist who looked at 102,000 kids who were uh, photo screened. And what he found was that 25% of the kids who failed the screening 
really did not have ambulogenic uh, risk factors. They were false positive screenings. Um, but 19% of these kids got glasses, and 32 were given glasses for a diopter or less. I just saw a kid yesterday that was in a glasses that were plus 0.5. Um, and he was one, years, one year old. So I, I, sometimes I take kids out of glasses all the time because they really don't need them and it's potentially you know, interfering with how their eye is growing. We don't want people to grow up to be adults who are farsighted because they're gonna be completely glasses dependent whereas people who are a little nearsighted might kinda like that when they get presbyopic. So the truth is we don't wanna put glasses on kids if we don't have to. So this is a study that I've been involved in to try to not only pick up on amblyopia, but to learn more about amblyopia, to learn more about eye tracking, to hopefully help develop better ways of treating this disease in the future. So this is a girl at my clinic here. Um, this is the EAE, which is the Entertainment Arts and Engineering Department, who I've been working with to try to develop this game. So this girl here is patched and playing our game. This is uh, the device we are using to try to follow eye tracking. And as you can see, it picks up at a sampling rate of 120 times a second. It's looking at the eyes to see where they are tracking. And um, we just put it at the bottom. It's 12 inches. So we just put it at the bottom of this computer screen and uh, just hook it up to a regular computer. Uh, this is from the website. This is a commercially available device that um, uh, creates a reflex off the eye here and then is able to use some algorithms to follow exactly where the eyes are following uh, targets on the screen. It's used primarily in product marketing to see where your eyes uh, are pulled when you are looking at a website um, because most things are driven by money. Um, but we are trying to use this to learn more about eye tracking. So what in these kids with amblyopia? So these are little targets here that the eyes are following and the longer they follow them they start breaking apart and um, uh, and go off the screen and then a new one will appear. So um, this is the eye tracking here. It's a quite simplistic game but uh, and then this is the target. There are different size targets and the targets all take a different path uh, from the periphery to the center, although the path is the same when we're comparing the, the, you know, the targets have a different path, but the, they're the same when we compare one eye to the other eye. So uh, what are we measuring? We are measuring how long it takes the kids to um, find the object, what is the distance between the uh, gaze and the center of the target, so how well are they following that target and how long do they follow that target. Each eye, we present 15 targets and then to we have each kid play it for about three to five minutes. We're looking at kids two to 17, those with normal acuity and then you know their siblings or kids who are referred to my clinic with just a normal screening and then comparing how they do between the two. The kids play the game with both eyes open and then we patch them and have play one guy against the other eye. And we're still collecting data on this. We're in the very early stages, but what we hope to learn is to know more about eye tracking and to know about these increased saccades and how they don't follow images as well and hopefully help develop novel treatments in the future. The hardest part of amblyopia is treating it and I'm gonna go into that a little bit and just uh, discuss the problems inherent in treating this. But if we can get binocular therapies, meaning if we can come up with treatments that use both eyes together, one, we may more adequately treat this disease and get these kids to use their eyes together better in the future. And second, the, and more importantly, they, should, they will probably be better tolerated and more effective at treating, this, at treating this disease. In the future, you know, I think eye tracking will help us understand a lot more about diseases. So much of the brain has visual pathways running through it. And we know these are affected in things like autism and ADHD where they don't look at faces, they track things differently, they, they are, you know, can't, can't follow, can't stay on task and can't stay on target. And you can just tell the second that you get a kid in your clinic who comes in that, you know, they say, oh, I think there's something wrong with their eyes and they're just, they can't follow anything. They can't even watch your screen just because their ADHD is so bad. And I, I think that a lot of that is a neurologic problem that vision tracking may tell us more about and, and, and help us develop more ways of treating it in the future. Cortical visual impairment is something I see in my clinic a lot. And these are kids who have brain damage and as a result don't have normal vision. And it can be from anoxic brain injury to, uh, or uh, hydrocephalus or uh, a lot of these are preemies who have had hemorrhages in their brain. But it's something that we're seeing more and more as our medical therapies get better at treating kids with these diseases and helping them live longer. 
we're learning more about the brain through the, uh, the problems they have in uh, visual perception and, and, and tracking. The hardest part about amblyopia is treating it. Um, and it is much easier to treat in younger children. Uh, this is my niece here who has got a patch on. It only takes weeks to months in infants and toddlers, but it takes months to years in older children. Um, and it's much tougher to treat in kids like her who you take their natural lens out because as I said, that lens that you're born with is amazing because it can change shape and focus things. Once you put a, a lens in her, you know you're setting it for distance and then have to put a bifocal in here. So it's just another reason not to want to use that eye. So th this is particularly tough to treat in children who have had catar unilateral cataracts. Um, how old is the oldest you can treat kids with amblyopia? It's a really good question and we don't fully know the answer to that and that can be frustrating for parents because you say, well, we don't know but we can try and see if we get a better answer and that uncertainty is always, is always difficult for parents but we know that in kids, this is a study done by the Pediatric Eye Disease Interest Group which is a large uh, organization that has many universities um, and private practices with doctors in it doing these big studies. But they found that, you know, in kids who are less than 12, um, patching, you know, there's a 53% um, improvement rate versus 25% in kids who are older than 13, which is quite amazing because we used to think that anything in the older age groups, we wouldn't get any improvement at all, but we're finding that even in those older age groups, there is some amount of brain plasticity that we are able to harness when we uh, treat these kids. Um, so the first thing we do is try to put glasses on these kids. Like we said, the kids who, you know, some of them, their strabismus gets a lot better when we put glasses on so their eyes are straighter and, and that's the first thing we do. Or we put glasses on them to treat uh, their anisometropia or their difference in prescriptions. Some kids we have to treat with contact lenses when they're really high powers in one eye. Um, we usually start with patching. Atropine is another thing that we can use to treat them, and I'll talk about that a little bit. It's an eye drop that penalizes one eye. Some people use optical penalization, meaning that they put a lens in front of the good eye that is, makes the vision blurry. Not super helpful sometimes because kids just look around that lens. A Bangator filter is kind of the same sort of thing. It's just a filter that goes over the good eye. There has even been some study done into acupuncture, and there have been some favorable um, results reported from that and vision therapy is something that doesn't have a whole lot of data behind it but some people are still trying it to see if it can help with treating any amblyopia. Um, glasses alone are, are all you need sometimes uh, and that's mostly in kids who have anisometropic amblyopia meaning they have a difference in their prescription between two eyes. In um, young kids just putting the glasses on them for uh, 18 weeks in two-thirds of kids three to seven they improved by two lines but as they got older, only a quarter of those kids improved by two lines, so that just got less as they got a little bit older. Patching can improve both their vision and their strabismus. Often as those kids start seeing better out of one eye, they um, uh, will start using that eye with the other eye and their strabismus or their eye misalignment will get better. Not always, but sometimes. Uh, it's best performed with adhesive patches because these felt ones are uh, much easier to peek around. You have to get the large ones but sometimes they are better tolerated just because kids don't like the stickiness being pulled off them. But this is really the most commonly common treatment, but you can imagine it's tough to convince a kid to keep that patch on for a couple hours a day. First, they don't want anything on their face. Second, they can't see out of that eye, it's blurry. So uh, it's really tough, but it's, and those first few months right after you discover it are the, really the time when you can get the best treatment out of these. So it, it, it's, it's a tough thing and it can be many months or, or even years to uh, get any kind of improvement. It used to always be thought that more patching was better, but PEDIG just you know, recently has done a big study looking at these kids with moderate amblyopia, so this isn't so bad a vision. 2040 is the driving cutoff, so a little bit worse than driving vision and found that two hours of patching was similar to six hours. And whether that's because nobody really gets the six hours in or not, we don't really know. But Two hours a day is usually what we start with patching uh, for, the, for these kids. Atropine is something that we can use. It seems a lot easier for some parents because you just put it in uh, twice a week rather than every day and it blurs the vision in their, in their good eye. It makes it so they cannot focus in their eye. So it makes them like an old person. So they 
can't see up close particularly because they would need a bifocal to do so, uh, which is great because it can help them flip fixation, but it is tough for kids who are already having trouble in school. So when we put this drop in, it makes it hard to do their schoolwork, uh, and, um, and so that can be a, a hurdle. So. Uh, we can also see, so this, in somebody who has a, uh, does not need glasses and we blur the vision in that eye, at distance, they will still have clear vision. It's just up close that their vision starts to get blurry. So you can imagine that if we're not blurring it that much, maybe we wouldn't have that much improvement. But we have shown that there is some improvement in their vision in people with severe amblyopia where we are not blurring their vision in their good eye enough uh, that it's even blurrier than their other eye. But this is something, usually I think most people use, move to after patching doesn't work because patching is usually just a set amount of time each day and, and usually uh, tends to be more effective than atropine. Uh, like I said, it can be making the schoolwork difficult. It makes that pupil large, uh, so it can, especially over the summer, that can be difficult because it uh, lets in more light. Um, it can flip the amblyopia, which I've done a time or two, where, so we have to follow these kids closely. If we blur the vision in that good eye, it can become the bad eye. So we have to be careful to watch these kids closely. And some kids have a bad reaction here where they become mad as a hatter and hot as a hare. So um, we have to kind of watch these kids too. Um, uh, and this is more likely to happen in kids less than three. Truth about amblyopia is it's an ongoing dynamic process where we have to uh, start with one treatment, sometimes move to another treatment, really keep encouraging these parents. Some of the parents just really don't like me because every time they come and see me, I just say, you gotta keep going, you gotta keep going. Um, and, and because this is the only time we could do this and, and this is the, uh, the only treatment we have. The sad part about our treatment is a, a quarter of kids are parent, uh, experience recurrence within the first year of treatment. This is more likely to occur in the kids who are patching longer and we just stop it. But even after we stop, sometimes it recurs and we have to restart again. So we have to keep you know, treating them until we're out of that critical period. But we don't know what the end of that critical period is in some kids. So we just have to keep following them, rechecking their vision and, and see where, uh, what the end of it is. Um, and uh, in summary, patients with treated amblyopia enjoy better vision as well as improved eye alignment and object tracking. Our, our treatments are much better when we pick up on this early, but our treatments aren't great. Right now, you know, all we can really do is force them to use the bad eye by uh, decreasing use of the good eye, but our hope in the future is that we can do more of these binocular treatments, hopefully get things, you know, working with computer games or things like that that are a little bit better tolerated and hopefully get their eyes to work a little bit better. Um, the truth now is that the biggest champ the, the biggest uh, burden of treating amblyopia is on the parents, and this is actually my sister, and uh, she spent many years patching, this is my niece again, and you can see that her eyes have turned out pretty straight, and she has 20-25 vision out of that eye, which is, I very rarely see most of these kids with unilateral cataracts, they do not end up with good vision in that eye, and that's really a testament to her and her patching over the years, but it, it's a struggle, and it's hard, and and most families just don't make it. They just can't get that get, can't get that patching. But it's much easier if we can pick up on it earlier. And hopefully, in the future, as we work together, and you know, the the, I'm a clinician and working on the clinician side of things in an MD, and you know, really seeing how these things happen in clinic. And hopefully, you know, we can work together and try to come up with better treatments in the future. So, that's it. Yes, I'm happy to um, answer any of these questions, any questions you have. At what age does amblyopia have to be detected in order for vision loss to be prevented? So the answer to that used to be about seven or eight years old, but recently PEDIC did a study to, that showed that even kids up to 13, if they put glasses on them for anisometropic amblyopia and, and patch them, if they hadn't been patched before, that they would get some benefit to treatment. They've also done some studies where they look at adults who have amblyopia, who have a horrible accident happened to their good eye and their, vision, you know, their amblyopic eye is all that they have. And they do find that those people, if they're only using that eye in adulthood, they can improve a line or two of their vision. Um, they've also done some studies patching some adults and found that they can get a little bit of improvement, but the second they stop patching, 
they lose that improvement. So the answer to this question, I, I think, is probably about 13, 14 years old that we can uh, get some amount of a vision improvement. But the frustrating things for parents is it really depends on how de deep the amblyopia is. And um, we have to often try to see if we can get it better. Yes? What, what age would it be if you wanted to make full vision? Would that be just an improvement? Young, younger. It's usually the young, to get back to 20 20 vision, you mean, in both eyes. Uh, usually the kids who have just anisometropic amblyopia, meaning they just have a difference in the prescription, those kids are much easier to treat than the kids who have eye crossing and amblyopia. So some kids are crossed and have a difference in their prescription, and those kids are harder to treat. But if you catch them in the first, you know, before five years old, you know, I think you can still get them back to 2020. But a lot of this, as I, is, a lot of it has to do with how good the, they are at patching, which is really the bottom line. Um, what can be done for a 73-year-old amblyopian? We don't know the answer to that. And we are, you know, there are, we are working on binocular treatments now to see if playing games that stimulate both eyes where, you know, using a filter to, or um, contrast to uh, blur the vision in the good eye and forcing them to use the other one and, and use them together, will that functionally improve any part of their vision? And we don't know the answer to that at this point. So at this point, nothing, but we're working on that to see because I, you know, I think there's a lot about the brain we don't know and, and uh, retraining the brain uh, in the future. We hope to figure that out. Though I recall you said you are still collecting data, have you been informally observing that the game is more effective for children of certain ages than for children of other ages? Um, we're really still kind of de developing an algorithm to try to follow these tracking, but yes, it's, it's, it's definitely the kids who are older and more familiar with computer games that are um, uh, better at tracking and have, and have better data in their good eye you know, versus their, their other eye. But I think it would be very interesting to compare like my two-year-old who's obscene because she can you know, use YouTube and find things on there. I, 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 if I, you compared her to kids 20 years ago, I bet she would be better at following a thing on a computer screen than these kids before because they're just so used to that now. Um, my eight-year-old grandson looks through my kaleidoscope by holding the scope off to the side rather than straight ahead. Does this indicate a problem? Probably not. Um, I'd have to see how they were holding it, but um, it might be worth getting him checked if he's really looking through the outside. Uh, but when you're looking through a kaleidoscope, there are entertaining things to look at all over it, so I don't know necessarily. If, you're, if they have good vision in both eyes, not, it wouldn't be something to, to worry about, but a kaleidoscope's kind of hard because sometimes you aren't always looking at the central target there. So it might be worth getting them looked at. Is amblyopia inherited? Yes. Or genetic in nature? Yes. And I am often struck because I will see kids who, it's always the right eye, you know, there'll be siblings there and it will be the right eye in every kid. And, and why is that the case? I don't know. It just means that, that genetically some way there's a reason for them to have smaller eyes on one side. Certainly eye crossing is very inherited. Um, some families have eye crossing and eye drifting out that, that, are inher that uh, run in those families. Uh, as a child, I had a lazy eye strabismus, had surgeries, see great now with no glasses. Will I have challenges in the future? No, likely not. You've likely overcome all that and developed and you're out of that critical period, so things should be kind of the same. The interesting thing comes often when you, um, sometimes when people get cataract surgery or LASIK surgery, it changes how their prescription is and sometimes that strabismus can get worse if you've had strabismus in the past. Um, Sometimes when you become presbyopic and start needing bifocals, things can change a little bit. Sometimes people are able to control what we call a latent misalignment, so they have a tendency to drift, but they don't have a problem. But then when you change something by their eyes, needing reading glasses, that, that can kind of change things. But in general, no, except if you have cataract surgery, you, it, it may change things a little bit, but I bet you will adapt and be okay. Um, how does hypotonia affect vision and what's the best treatment? Um, 
That's a good question. Um, your eye muscles are different than most of the muscles in your body because they have so many fast twitch fibers in them. Your eyes are moving thousands and thousands of times a second as you do micro saccades. Um, so they're often affected, those muscles are often affected differently than hypotonia. And I've had this discussion before with kids also with ma you know, myotonic dystrophy or um, muscular dystrophy. Um, and in general, it doesn't affect the eye muscles so much, but I, I think that that is a question we don't fully know the answer to. How do you work with nonverbal kids? I work with lots of nonverbal kids. So most kids who, you know, or adults who are nonverbal are sent to my clinic, and that's what I love about my job is that I don't have to ask a lot of questions. Sometimes I could just kind of look and figure out, is this kid looking with both eyes by covering one eye, looking at the other eye? How is their visual behavior? Do they move their eyes all the way around? Um, and then dilating their eyes and then looking inside, I can figure out what the prescription is and is there any pathology in the back of the eye there. So um, I like that I can, I'm kind of the end of the road. I don't have to do a lot of referring out. I can kind of answer these questions. But in some ways, yeah, I'm kind of like a um, veterinary doctor. But it, I, I work with a lot of nonverbal kids and I, I don't mind seeing nonverbal kids always because I think that in other clinics they are, um, dismissed because nobody can figure things out. But in my job, a lot of what I do is just kind of looking at what I see and um, not having to get a whole lot of information back from them. Whereas the adults are my diff more difficult patients and um, I love working with them too because I think that they are my happiest patients. But I, um, uh, that's, you know, I kind of have a nice balance of that. Um, I think that's it. But if you, does anyone else have any other questions? Uh, oh, I missed yours? They were asked. Oh, I have this one. Oh, I did. I missed. I missed a couple of them. Yes. Okay. Infantile cataracts. What is their etiology, and does this condition in any way to cataract development? Um, there are kind of two different uh, types of infantile cataracts. Well, there are a couple of different types. Kids who are born with them in one eye, it is usually a fluke, and um, it's usually not inherited, and it is usually not associated with anything else. Um, and what the case is in those kids is that when your eye is developing, you, um, you have a, um, you know, so the front part of your eye, this is your lens, and your lens needs to be perfectly clear for you to see through it, and then your cornea is the clear part of the front of your eye. When, and then you have your iris here. When your eye is developing, there is an artery that is from the back of your eye, it's really from your nerve over here, and it extends forward to the front of your eye to give your eye the nutrients it needs as it's developing. That artery should completely disappear before your, the child is born. However, in some children it does not. So it keeps feeding nutrients and blood and things to the front of the eye, and then they develop a cataract at the back of that eye. Um, so it is just an abnormal feature of development. So those are the unilateral cataracts, are usually that, that, uh, that fashion. Sometimes they are anterior cataracts. Kids will be born with an anterior cataract on the front of the lens. Those usually do not cause any visual problem. We do not take those out, and they usually do not get worse over time. The one thing that they do have is sometimes the eye will grow differently around them, and then they will have astigmatism in that eye. The kids with the unilateral cataracts, we have to take those cataracts out in the first six weeks of life, or they will never have normal vision in that eye. The only way they will have normal vision in that eye is if they have a good parent who will patch them vigorously to get vision in that eye. Because just taking that cataract out isn't going to give them good vision in that eye. We really have to force them to use it. Um, those are the unilateral cataracts. Some kids are born with bilateral cataracts, and we have to sometimes, and sometimes it is inherited as an autosomal dominant trait. So there are families where this runs in their family, and 50% of the kids have this trait. Um, Usually they are not related to adult cataracts and they are totally different. It's not like they have a tiny, tiny cataract that's going to get bigger and bigger and, and develop when they're older. Usually if they have them, they're going to develop in the first, if they're very small, they're going to get worse in the first, you know, 10 years of life and, and need to be removed. But they are just a totally different entity than adults. So everybody, if you live long enough, you will develop cataracts. And these children who develop them, it's because their eye, their lens did not develop normally and there is some amount of 
um, impurity in their lens or, or they got too, many, too much nutrients grow, uh, in, in the beginning. Um, the other kinds of cataracts I see a lot in my clinic are kids who are treated with massive doses of steroids for chemotherapy and they develop cataracts as well. Um, and those are more like the adult kind of cataracts that you see that are just, you know, like the posterior plaques and things. So those are more like the adult cataracts that we see. These infantile ones are just totally different and are just an abnormal uh, feature of development. What is the relationship between amblyopia and strabismus? So 50% um, of kids with amblyopia will have strabismus and 50% of kids with strabismus will have amblyopia. So there's a, there's a very close tie between those two. Sometimes we don't know, is this eye turning because those eyes were different shapes at the beginning and they started favoring that eye, or did the eye start turning and then became amblyopic and then grew differently and the eyes became anisometropic? We don't know the answer to these. They are very closely intertwined, but the people who have both of those are the toughest, like I said, the toughest to treat and the, you have to get on them the earliest to, to get any improvement. Can you briefly explain the logic behind your computer game to detect lazy eye in children, i.e., how does it diagnose lazy eye? What feedback is there for the patient? So um, we know that tracking in these kids is abnormal, especially in their amblyopic eye. And you can tell this just when you're checking their vision in the clinic because they will kind of, when, they're when they read the line with this eye, they'll just read it straight across. If they read it with this eye, They'll kind of look all around and just, and, and it's, it's like they're trying to put together pieces of a puzzle and trying to get those images in there. So th if you're having them follow a target, our, our hypothesis is that following that target, they're not going to follow it as well and they're going to bounce off of it more. And um, that just, if you compare how they follow targets to one eye to the other eye that's amblyopic, we are anticipating that we will see a different in how the difference in how they track those targets. What kind of a difference we see will hopefully help us develop ways to better treat that and to better improve their tracking in the future. And you know, the big thing we're seeing is reading wise. And I, you know, a lot of these parents will just bring their kids in and say, "Yeah, they because this kid isn't doing well in school. Do you think it's related to their?" the fact that you know we're patching and I say no I don't think it's related to the reason we're patching but I think it's related to the fact that they have this amblyopia I don't think they track things as well I think it's a little bit tougher for them to learn to read but the truth is the only way we're going to get it better is if you keep working on it but I, I, I think that that parents knowing that that's a factor and it can also help them so Yes, the answer to that question is uh, we're detecting it just by how they follow a target because they don't stay on a target as well. They're kind of having ballistic saccades. They're not smoothly following a target across. They're kind of like trying to find it as they follow along. Um, what is the treatment protocol for amblyopia starting with infancy? Um, so it's tough in infancy. You know, these kids that we take the cataracts out of, um, I usually do surgery a week later you know, put their contact lens on them, treat them, and then tell the parents to patch their good eye half the time they're awake. Um, I have seen one patient who had an infantile cataract that was overpatched, so their bad eye became their good eye just for, because they were patching all but one hour a day. So it is, it is pot, and then that eye developed glaucoma, and it was really kind of a nightmare. So um, it is possible to overpatch these kids, so you have to follow them closely. But it, it depends on the type of amblyopia. These kids who are born with cataracts have very severe amblyopia so they need a lot of patching. These kids, where you pick up on a kid with a year old that has some amblyopia who just needs glasses, you probably don't need to patch them at all. Um, whereas these kids who come in who are crossing and have need glasses, you're going to need to do a lot of patching. So usually we start with glasses, see them back. If there's still a difference between their vision, we start with two hours of patching. We do that for several rounds. So we do that for you know six, six or nine months. And then if there's still no um, improvement after after that time, we either add atropine um, or increase the amount of patching. Um, so it's really different. It's, it's like that last slide said, it's a really dynamic process and it's a different for every kid. So um, it requires a lot of visits and a lot of coming back and I think for parents it can be very frustrating. Um, so I think if we, you know, if we can get better treatments in the future, I think it would be better tolerated. I think I went through all the cards now. Sorry, they gave them to me out of order. Sure. Um, we have, you know, they, they have done some of those. Um, 
a lot of these ethnic groups have different kinds of refractive errors. You know, we know that the Navajo population has very high uh, amounts of with the rule astigmatism um, in both eyes, and a lot of them have bilateral amblyopia. What does that mean? That means their vision is so blurred without glasses that even when you see this kid at eight years old and put glasses on them, you cannot ever get their vision to 20-20 because they have never learned to see. So we see a lot of that bilateral amblyopia in the Navajo populations, and we've been working actually through division outreach with those kids um, and, and trying to get on those reservations and see those. A lot of Hispanic kids as well have um, a lot of with the rule astigmatisms and then we know that a lot of uh, Asian kids have, are, are very nearsighted. As a population, as a world in general, we are becoming much more nearsighted and that's just because people are doing more and more computer work and, and things up close. So I think some of this, the refractive error in things is, is changing with times. but. Um, I think most of those studies have kind of been, yeah, we've done a lot with the Navajos, um, other underserved populations. I don't know the answer to that. Yes? I gave you the question about genetics. Yes. It's, it's recessive, definitely, and I think there's some amount of environmental component as well. It's certainly not a straightforward genetic, yeah, dom dominant or recessive. I think it's even, there's some other modifying factors as well, definitely. Yes? It is genetic, for sure. For sure, it, it runs in families and, um, um, we don't really understand why. We don't, we don't know why some kids start crossing because usually they have a totally otherwise normal brain. Some of it has to do with uh, refractive correction and things, but not all the time. Some, you know, some kids are just born with huge esotropia and we don't know why. It's kind of interesting. I, here I see lots of accommodative esotropia, meaning that we can fix it with glasses. Um, whereas my mentor, Dr. Hoffman, said that when he, trained, when he worked in Michigan, he saw mostly all infantile esotropia. So there is, you know, definitely population differences. Um, yes? He's growing a lot and becoming more nearsighted. If he has equal vision in both eyes or pretty close, you don't know, you don't have a clue. Most kids, if they just, if they tell you that, um, they're just fine because they're just, their eye is growing bigger. They're becoming more nearsighted. So, yes. Yes, and, and those kids who have high myopia, you know, or have a lot of, just kind of tend to, and I was one of those kids, I'm a minus seven. So I, you know, in those eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 years, every year I was growing a, a diopter or two. And, and it, that's, that's okay, yes, those are usually fine. The truth is at 13 or 14, we probably can't treat any amblyopia anyway. And most kids don't tell you about amblyopia, that's the problem. Most kids will not say, oh, I can't see out of this eye. I mean, almost no kids do that. Um, so when they tell you that their vision's bad, it's bad in both eyes. So it's not usually an issue. And not correcting myopia doesn't create problems visually because myopia is what most people have, their eyes too big, but everything up close is clear, so they will develop normal vision. So yeah, oftentimes when kids, when kids come in with a dye after two or three of, of myopia, I'll just ask the parents, are you noticing any problems? And if they say no, I'll say, yeah, they don't need glasses. Would glasses make them better? Yeah, but if they're not having problems, it's probably not an issue and it's not gonna affect them in the long run. Well, thank you so much for coming. I really enjoyed sharing with you what I am passionate about and not always the most thrilling topic for others, but uh, for those of us who have been affected by it or, or um, you know, have family members or things, it's, it's something that's you know, near and dear to us. So thanks. Mm -hmm.